Hello everyone and welcome to the American Civil War and UK History channel on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Remember if you go on YouTube to make sure you subscribe and also sign in. So this is the English Civil War series, the first episode. Um, today we're going to try and explain how and why the English Civil War started and to help me do this I have Martin Russell. So hello Martin, would you like to explain uh, a little bit about yourself please? Hi, oh, sure. I've been a keen military historian for about 50 years. I spent 40 or so years doing various reenactment, including the sealed knot, which, as you know, does English Civil War. I fought as both musketeer and pikeman, both parliamentarian and royalist, and ended up from a sins being Sergeant Major General of Parliament. Thank you. I didn't know that he was Major General. I didn't know that. When was when was that? Oh, uh, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, but before my time then. Well, my, mind you, I've, I've been here quite a long time. About 18 years, I think. Anyway, okay, so we're going to try and uh, uh, explain the English Civil War, which is quite complicated, uh, especially of how it started. So the English Civil War, which involves not just England, but Scotland, Ireland and Wales and also pit brother against brother and father against son. The wars would happen between 1642 and 1651. So it's a series of wars, it's not just one war. Um, the first and second wars would involve supporters of Charles I, known as the Royalists, Cavaliers, and supporters of the Long Parliament Roundheads. Martin, could you please explain the meanings behind the nicknames, please? Yeah. the. The Royalist Army became quickly synonymous with um, the dashing uh, Prince Rupert, nephew of King Charles, and the word cavalier comes from caballeros, the Spanish meaning gentleman of the cavalry, whilst Parliament quickly became known as roundheads from the portraying the, the true shape of the head by eschewing anything of vanity, although it's not strictly speaking the very first nickname, the first one were actually Bambury men from the little market town in North Oxford, which was a hotbed of uh, Puritan, Puritanism. And so they were known as Bunbury men, the Ranters. Thank you. Uh, there was also obviously the Third War, was, uh, which involved supporters of Charles II, which is obviously Charles I's son, and supporters of the Rump Parliament. We are going to talk about the reasons behind why the, why the war started. There are lots of reasons and, you know, it's not just one particular reason the English Civil War is quite complicated. So we'll try and explain the main reasons of why it started. So I'm just going to start this up. So here we have, so Charles I succeeds the throne from his father, who is also King of Scotland. So this is the first time England and Scotland become a union, uh, James I of England and James VI of Scotland. So he goes on the throne in 1625, not long after he marries a Roman Catholic princess called Henrietta Maria. Um, so Martin, can you just explain a little bit about um, religion in, in England and, and the UK at the time, please? Well, the king is of course, by very definition, the King of England, and therefore is defender of the faith, and England is a Protestant country. So he's not really, um, he's not really accepted that he should marry not only a Roman Catholic, but a French Roman Catholic, um, France being one of our hereditary enemies. It was unusual, it was a political marriage like all, but it was unusual, in fact, that they, the fact that they simply loved each other, which was usually not the case with arranged marriages. In the country itself, there were still closet Catholics, a few, but the main difference between High Church of the Anglicans is ceremonies, bells and smells, which to the simpler, more puritanical forms, this is tantamount to popery. So when the king marries a French Catholic princess, they really don't like it. Archbishop Lord, tries to settle this by taking the some of the less strict forms of Puritanism and some of the less uh, ceremonial parts of High Church and blending the two together in a way of smoothing the waters between them and in so doing actually alienates both sides. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then in 1626 
he makes a speech to the Lords and the Commons, which sets the tone for his reign, which, as you can imagine, doesn't go down well. And when you hear it, you will you will work that out for yourselves. So, Martin, do you know what he actually said to the Parliament? Yeah, it was. Remember, Parliaments are altogether in my power. For their calling seated and dissolution, therefore, as I find the fruits of them good or evil, they are to continue or not to be. And remember, if you persist in your errors, you make them greater and irreconcilable. But if you do not go, not sorry, if you but if you do go not to mend them, you will do yourselves honour and your and you will encourage me to go on with parliaments. In other words, do what I ask and I'll continue to call you. See, the thing is, I think what people forget to understand about this period is you're moving from, um, you know, the period where you have um, Elizabeth into James, but it's, it's the way the kingdom, uh, the way the, the king's role or the, the royal's role has changed in that 200 years or that 150 years, hasn't it, from Henry all the way up to that point. And it sort of changed a little bit. So, you know, Parliament's role in general, how much has it changed in that little period? Because it, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? Because before the king was basically in charge of everything. That's the way I've always understood it. So do you know anything about that? Um, well, yeah, basically he's, he's had drunk because he wasn't intended to be king. It was his elder brother, Henry, who died suddenly, that he was thrust, this sort of nervous, stammering youngster who was destined for the church, to be a king. And his father drummed it into him that God has ordained you and therefore God is the only one above you. And that's not really the way the king had operated beforehand. He no. takes it literally, whereas Parliament are there, they believe they're elected by the people to represent the people and to run the country for the king yeah so very much a clash of cultures although you have to remember it's not quite as the democracy of today because then the people of the country and the people who stood for parliament were actually the landowners mm -hmm. so charles charles basically thinks he's got the defined right by god to rule the kingdoms as king basically that's right okay so from 1629 to 1640 he ruled without a parliament which is called the personal rule of Charles I or the 11 year tyranny. All groups that didn't like the way the country was being run come together to form a single party under the control of mainly Puritans. So what, how does the Puritan faction start? Well, Puritans literally means the pure word of God. So they take very simple basic ideas and concepts and as far as they're concerned, that is the be all and end all of life. And anything outside of that is subservient. OK, so. We then move on because obviously the rebellion actually starts in Scotland. Now, rebellion in Scotland, he tried to reform the church in Scotland um, and try to impose a new prayer book. Um, so the, explain a little bit about this uh, prayer book, please. Well, it's the, called the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and what he tries to do, what Lord tries to do when he writes this is to stress ceremony is sacred. And of course, to the, the Scottish Presbyterians, who are a bit like the English Puritans, ceremony was the last thing on their mind. What they wanted was the word of God, and that is it. They don't want the bells and smells and all the decorations and idolatry, as they call them. They want to be the word of God. A preacher standing in a pulpit preaching the word of God as they've interpreted it. They don't want all the frills and all the fancy bits and all the ceremony and singing and high art class artwork and gilding of the gilding of the lilies, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you know, this ends in, in, in revolt against the king in two small little wars, one in 1639 and one in 1640, known as the Bishop Wars. The English army in the first war was defeated. Scotland, uh, the Scottish, sorry, ended up invading Northeast England and captured Newcastle for a time. After this, Charles is bankrupt and couldn't pay his army. Most of them desert. Charles did attempt to get the Scots back on his side. Remember, he is King of Scotland as well. 
So he went to Edinburgh, but they were not interested, but they did promise not to oppose Giles. But when the war in England came, they would stand and wait the outcome. But I know, and you know, Martin, they did get involved in the end, didn't they? Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, in 1644, Parliament signed with the Scots and an agreement, and the Scots term it the Solemn League and Covenant. Um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Parliament promises to impose Presbyterianism as the Scots see it, but in fact intend not to do that. They intend to keep it as Puritanism. It's purely to get Scots on their side. What you have to remember, the Civil War by 44 has diversed into many local armies and any army in excess of 10,000 is a major force. The Scots crossed the border in 44 at the head of 22,000 men. So quite a tip of balance of power in that region. They So anyway, at this point, obviously, there hadn't been a, um, you know, parliament for 11 years. At this point, um, you know, he, he needs money to, uh, you know, so um, be, he'd been twisting and manipulating the uh, tax laws the whole time. The king mismanaged the country. This would upset merchant classes, among others. He also reintroduced some dormant taxes, one called ship money, which also caused more anger and unrest. So ship tax, what's, what's that all about? Right. Basically, we're an island race, so maritime power is quite important, internationally speaking, although we weren't the um, empire that we related to become. So ship tax is a tax that's levied equally on all coastal counties, supposedly to pay for the upkeep of the navy. But Charles is a bit careful here and a bit canny. What he does, he makes a public statement without warning Parliament, saying that 60 or so years ago, 1588 to be precise, if the British Navy hadn't, or the English Navy, hadn't defeated the Spanish Armada, they would have shipped Palmer's veterans from the Spanish held lowlands across and invaded the country. So the Navy really protects the whole of the country, not just the, so, not just the coastal counties. Consequently, he aims to reestablish this, but spread it across every county, inland as well. And on the surface, this seems great because it means that the old amount levied on the coastal counties will be drastically reduced because now all the inland counties are contributing. However, Parliament have a spy in the Royalist camp and they let on that if on the first day of reading this is passed, the subclause will then instigate exactly the same level of taxation as there always used to be on the coastal counties and the same on the inland counties, thus trebling the income which Charles could, could then cream off. Parliament, desperate not to give away the fact they have a spy, have to think some way of defeating this on the very first reading without giving the game away. So what they do is they have to draw up a list of which MPs they can trust. Because remember, not every MP was anti-King. So they draw up this list and they send them the information and put a blanket excuse for, which will obscure them, the truth about why they're, why they're opposing it. And what they do is they select two members of parliament which are nicknamed or codenamed the big ships. The firebrand MP for Aino in North Oxfordshire, John Hamden, and a little known country bumpkin called Oliver Cromwell. And he's the MP for Ely in Cambridgeshire. So the coded message goes out for people to gather and sign this petition. And the coded message was the big ships sail between Ely and Aino on the first day of September. And all that is remembered these days, or certainly wasn't when I was a kid, is a garbled skipping tune that Cools used to chant whilst playing with a skipping rope, and it's the big ship sails up the alley alley <laughs> That's great. Anyway, so for the first time in 11 years, the king is forced to recall parliament in the spring of 1640, because obviously he needs money for the second war, the second bishops war in Scotland or against the Scots. Um, but because they hadn't sat for a long period, they had lots of grievances, as you could imagine, you know, they're getting quite frustrated at this point. They refused to give him any money, so he dis 
dissolves them again in May of 1640. He then later recalls them back again in November 1640, obviously because he needs money again. Because uh, he, I understand as well that he was quite extravagant, wasn't he? He did like spending money, like most kings. He he did. In fact, he had one of the greatest collections of art at the time. Okay. This is called the Long Parliament. So this is the new Parliament coming in November 1640, and uh, heading up this uh, new Parliament is a guy called John Pym, who was elected to lead Parliament. S set about by uh, bringing in a set of laws to prevent the king from dissolving without the permission of parliament, along with other things that the king didn't agree with. Um, but all parliament really wanted was reform in the way the parliament was run by king, by the king. So again, you know, he's pushing his luck a little bit. Um, Henrietta Maria, she does try to convince the king that he should be ruling without a parliament. Um, but in 1641, Charles reluctantly agrees with the terms and the new laws. And one of the laws being, what was that, Martin? What was the uh, one of the laws, the main laws? Uh, no parliament, sorry, all parliaments must be recalled no more than three years after the dissolution of their previous sitting. Okay, so because the Parliament couldn't directly take out their frustration on him, they took it out on the Earl of Stratford, Thomas Wentworth, by putting him on trial for treason. So during this period, he was uh, the advisor to the king, wasn't he? So he was uh, basically directly involved in pretty much most of what was going on in that 11 years, I take it, along with others. Yeah, he was, he'd actually just, re just been recalled from Ireland. And he put he gives some quite um, virulent statements about the the treachery of Englishmen who failed to support their king, whole and whole soul and body, and this is the excuse they use to impeach him as a traitor. And of course, this forces the king. They actually force the king to sign a new bill on this, don't they? On this, yeah, up. he's forced into signing um, the warrant for the arrest and um, execution of his friend. Thomas Wentworth. Um, it's the only way he can get the money he so desperately needs. And it's the one and only time he ever blames the Queen for the situation. The rest of the time, they are a marriage of lovers, mm -hmm. which is, as I've said before, is very unusual for the period. Yes, definitely. And uh, so he he unfortunately meets his doom on the, on the scaffold um, and gets executed. Um, in November 1641, Parliament presents Charles with a list of 201 objections to his government, gov uh, sorry, governmental methods known as the Grand Remonstrement. That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> the Grand Remonstrement. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit of a mouthful, yes. Anyway, sorry, there's John Pym. I've, I've uh, gone on to the wrong pictures here. So, sorry, this is the guy that uh, Wentworth guy. I've uh, I've got a bit behind on the on the loading the pictures up. Do apologise. There we go. There's a grand remonstrance. So this is a massive list. I've got visions of him, uh, you know, like in a film when they get the the parchment and it rolls onto the floor. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, two hundred and one separate objections. They they really did mean to get to get some blood out of this stone, didn't they? They certainly did. Um, anyway, events start escalating very quickly now. And not only along with England, in 1641, Ireland also went into rebellion. And um, what was that, what was that caused by? Uh, religion or? It's basically religion. Yeah, the um, both England and Scotland had put had started uh, making what was called plantations or new settlements in Ireland. Um, but as the Scots were Presbyterian and the English were Puritans, this is Protestant and. Ireland was traditionally a Catholic country and the expression um, beyond the pale means outside of our outside of civilization because each settlement town each per, each part plantation would have a pale or fence built around it to separate it from the the wild extremes and um, what they viewed as being the lawlessness of the of the Catholic Irish and uh, anyway 
the army, obviously, the, the army was needed, but the king's opponents did not trust him with an army. But he argued that you cannot have a royal army without a king. So they wasn't going to send an army um, with the king at the head of it. Who would, did, Do you know who, if they was going to send someone else or would, did they send an army in the end or did they not bother? Um, elements were raised and sent, but um, as the Civil War progresses, the king claims ownership of them and slowly ships them back via Chester to supplement his field armies. And quite often, the um, although they were English troops returning, they were known as Irish regiments, and that automatically put the backs of the parliamentarians who were expected to be invaded by mur murdering, child-eating papists. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so this is quite important. So this is the five me the five leading members of the House. Um, so who do we have here, Martin? Well, John Pym becomes the leader of the House of Commons. Arthur Hesselrig is the, he goes down in history as being the, the only man to be able to afford to equip a complete three-quarter armoured regiment of Carassias. The, the only one in the Civil War. There were individuals, but he was the only regiment to have them. They were nicknamed the Lobsters from the articulated plates. John Hamden is a real, real out-and-out anti-royalist vehement um, Puritan and if it's not for the, wasn't for the fact that he got killed very very early on in the war at a minor skirmish out Southampton uh, Southam way I believe it was almost certain that he would be he and not Cromwell that would come down to us as the winner of the civil wars. William Strode not quite so important Denzel Holes his reign his main um, claim to fame is he raised a regiment that was so well disciplined, despite their lack of experience, that at Edge Hill, when um, 4,000 of Charles Essex's brigade of infantry and the 1,400 cavalry of Ramsay's wing broke, chased by 2,500 of Rupert's Roy, Roy's cavaliers, his regiment of around 800 calmly formed Edge Up, waited for them to dive around and then reformed and carried on with what they were doing. Pretty astounding when you consider that, apart from himself and a couple of his officers, None of them had ever been in war before. Okay, thank you. Okay, so on the 4th of January, 1642, the five members who have been expecting the king to strike took their seats as usual that morning. At about three o'clock, they received word via French ambassador that Charles was on his way and he had, um, and they left the house and went into hiding. King Charles wanted to arrest them he entered Eng the, Eng uh, the English House of Commons, accompanied with around 80 soldiers armed with pistols and swords. Please explain a little bit more about this, please. Well, this was a, a severe breach of parliamentary privilege and Parliament responded by announcing the King's order to the city to seize the five members to have no basis in law. It announced also that any person doing so will be guilty of a breach of privilege of Parliament and deemed to be a public enemy of the Commonwealth of the land. Any person harbouring the five, on the other hand, should immediately receive parliamentary protection. You've got me at it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm under the impression as well that the, 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 the monarch is not supposed to enter the House of Commons. Is that is that true? No, that's right. It's a parliamentary privilege. The Houses of Parliament are set up so that they may meet and discuss in matters of state without interruption for the king before presenting their findings to the king to agree. OK, so because um, there was a isn't there a throne or something, but is that in that's in the House of Lords, isn't it? Yeah, the main seat. It's where the speaker yeah. sits, but the speaker is elected by Parliament from amongst Parliament and whilst in occupation of the chair, it's his job to um, it's his job to administer the discussions at almost like um, a chairman, so to speak, but he has no voice of his own. He can only speak with what is instructed by Parliament. So in other words, he controls so when they're arguing a point, he controls the argument until a decision is made and then he announces the decision. He can't make it himself. No, so him entering, entering the House of Commons really stirs up the pot it does it, it um those members of parliament that were wavering about um parliament's anti 
king feeling, a lot of them immediately bridled this and, and made their minds up for them. So at this point, the, uh, the militia was forming in London anyway. They would have quite easily overpowered the king's army and his small guard of 80. He, fl he flees the capital, obviously fearing for his wife's life, obviously being a Roman Catholic and his children's lives. And they end up um, in York. And uh, from York, the king then decides to send a small army out to Hull to collect weapons and ammunition, but they were refused entry to the city. Um, in the summer of 1642, both sides spent the time trying to recruit. Now, what I didn't realise is a lot of the troops were actually volunteers. Yeah, well, you've got, you've got a mixture. Um, you've got volunteers, but also you've got to try and, try and realise, especially in the countryside, if somebody sits in a manor house and controls directly the adjacent village and surrounding farms, he is your lord and master. He protects you, he looks after you and he deals with you with justice um, and if somebody steals your pig he says that the person responsible is apprehended so if he decides he's going to be a parliamentarian or a royalist then you haven't really got a lot of say in the matter you become okay, members know. of his regiment yeah and uh, so also this is also a time of when the word is starting to be printed a bit more widely isn't it and leaflets and I, I, obviously, uh, a lot more people are becoming, uh, you know, more literate and propaganda. There's always, there's, you know, I know one guy, there was one guy called John Lilburn, is it? Yeah, yes, Leveller Lilburn. He writes loads of seditious, um, or what the royalists call seditious pamphlets and gets put in jail several times. He even gets him put in jail by his own side for getting so uh, carried away with some of his complaints. Um, you don't have newspapers as such. What you have are broadsheets, which is basically, uh, I suppose in modern terms, so you imagine a, a sheet of A4 folding off, so you've got four small pages, or maybe just printed double-sided as uh, two pages. That's your broadsheet. It's a broad outline of the news today, in my opinion. And they might be completely different to the bloke down the street who's also printing one and sides with the other side. Okay. So you get lots of exaggerations. You know, massive royalist army defeated by a few brave parliamentarians. And the other one goes, uh, the the host of the rightly king smashed the rebels. Okay. So lots, of, lots of enthusiasm, lots of exaggeration. And you had to really take your life in your own hands by being found in possession of these if you were caught by somebody who didn't support the broadsheet you were reading. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of enthusiasm. But with po promise of pay, they managed to both convince enough men. Um, how many men did they actually convince in the beginning? It's a little hard to say exact numbers, but it was carried out. It was carried out in a very haphazard way. At the time, you had what was then the period version of the TAs today, called uh, called the the trained bands. So each large town or city would have a trained band regiment. Each county would have a trained band regiment. They were volunteers. So they provided their own, what they interpreted as military kits, so they'd be totally non-uniformed. They provided their own weapons and their, their job was to meet one Sunday afternoon after church per month and practice their postures, in other words, drill. So that if there was a military insurrection or a foreign invasion, they would could be caught, drop what they were doing, be called out and defend their town, city or county. And the militia you mentioned earlier in London train bands actually had 13 regiments okay. under Major General Philip Skippen. Um, the, a lot of these train bands in the country, though, were totally unreliable. They were gentlemen, gentlemen adventurers, merchants, tradesmen and so on. And one Sunday afternoon a month was not really enough to give them anything. They were just, it was a hobby more than anything else and impressing the women by how well they could drill and march in formation. Hmm. So what most train bands ended up doing is being called out by the first representative to get to them, be that royalist or parliamentarian, reviewed, promptly disbanded, their weapons confiscated and to go into your arsenal. And then those who you could would be persuaded to be 
volunteers in the local regiment. So they were way, it was a source of, of um, weapons and equipment, really. The main way of raising men, though, was to give a, a commission of array. So if we take an infantry regiment, the either the king or the parliament's representative comes to you as a landowner and gives you a commission of array to be a colonel of foot, a great privilege. But there's a lot of implications involved. It also means if you say yes, you are openly declaring your armed allegiance to that cause. If you say no, regardless of what your reasons are, you're automatically assumed to be equally exposed to the opposite camp. So you got to think very carefully about what you said. And you commissioned, say you're for infantry, theoretically, you needed to find 1,200 men. You needed to find somebody you knew how to train them. You had to give them a coat. You had to keep them in shoes. You had to make sure they were paid and fed, or else they'd desert. You had to provide them with weapons. And yes, occasionally, you would get a supply of powder. The rest of the time, you had to keep it, otherwise they're useless. Yes, you'd occasionally get weapons given, but otherwise you need to find them or else they're pointless. Yes, you might occasionally get issues of shoes, but without them, they'd go home because they couldn't march without shoes. So you had to provide them and the same would pay. You might occasionally get a pay chest, but the rest of the time you had to or else they'd desert. And all this on the understanding that if our side wins the war, if your regiment does well and is still in existence, if you've done well in leading them and still alive. When and if we could afford it, we'll see about compensating you. That's an awful lot of financial ifs to agree to. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so on the 22nd of August, 1642, the King raises his standard at Nottingham. So just explain a little bit about this for me. Well, he ceremonially raised it to say, I am here, I am the king, this is my country, I am your king. Rally here, let us rid the nation of all these rebels. And everybody cheered and raised glasses and drunk a salute. And about 20 minutes later, a freak, freak gust of wind blew it down again. Bit of an omen, should have taken note, but they did yeah. it. Um, so from this point, there was no going back. That is sort of like the, um, isn't it, the goading, putting that up. Um, to the Parliament. At this point, there's no going back. The English Civil War was inevitable. And uh, no matter what anyone did, it was going to happen. Um, uh, I must mention, obviously, I didn't mention Oliver Cromwell. You had mentioned Cromwell a little bit earlier. Um, I just want to know about his involvement at the beginning, because uh, he's he's in Parliament at the time, isn't he? But is he involved in the background? No, not at all. He's a, he's a minor landowning farmer who was actually on the verge of selling up and emigrating to, to the Americas, the New World, and he's persuaded to stay behind. He's one of many MPs. Uh, if you see things like the, the wonderful film, the, um, the wonderful film Cromwell came out some years ago, great cast list, great casting of the characters, just the way you read into them, but the bits about him giving orders to Colonel Camden at Edge Hill is complete rubbish. He oh, wow. was a captain in charge of 40 men, and that was it. Whereas Hamden was in charge of 4,000 infantry and many troops of cavalry, Cromwell's been one of them. It was Hamden, as I said earlier, who would, would re inevitably have been the kingpin of the Parliament cause and successor of the civil wars if he hadn't died so early, leaving space for somebody later, Cromwell in this case, to take in, to step in. So he basically steps into his shoes then, basically. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, not straight away, but yeah. yeah, he fulfilled that destiny that Parliament would, Parliament would succeed. OK, and this is the first. Um, so, yeah. And the first big battle of, of the English Civil Wars would take place in October 1642 in a peaceful Warwickshire country, in the peaceful Warwickshire countryside, a place called Edge Hill. And that's for another day. So we will discuss that at another point because I know you've done a lot of research in that, haven't you, Martin, with a, a fellow yeah. friend yeah, of yours? I used to live at Kyneton, just down the bottom of the hill. So 30-odd um, years of walking those bits you can get to, because there's a great big ammunition dump in the middle of it. But, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of research and lots of interesting differences between the two sides. Okay, cool. 
So, like I said, guys, this is our first uh, video of the series. Um, hopefully, it was uh, informative. Um, anyway, Martin, thank you very much for coming to explain a few things to me and uh, everyone else. And uh, thank you, thanks a lot. And uh, remember, guys, if you if uh, to subscribe to the channel and if you like the video, like it and obviously leave a little comment. And hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.